We're going to change it up, and I would try to say your name, but we're going to have to talk about the future of AI. Introduce yourself for the record, because I guarantee you I will slaughter your name, sir. Sorry about that. But I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Is this, uh, Turn the green button on, lights up. Aha, uh -huh. I'm supposed to be an engineer and a computer <laughs> scientist, so if I can't figure it out. They do say audiovisual is the hardest part. AI is easy. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You Introduce yourself for the record, please, sir. Absolutely, we'll do that. Uh, so I'm uh, Roman Yampolsky. I have a PhD in computer science and engineering. I am a tenured professor at one of the major Commonwealth universities, but I'm speaking as a, as a citizen, as a Kentuckian. Let's see if I can get to that slide. So standard disclaimer, my employer is not responsible for all the things I'll share with you. Uh, just trying to inform you about state of the art in AI. I'm not a lobbyist. I don't think it's a partisan issue. I don't have a specific agenda for you. I just want to let you know what uh, I think is happening. And I was told I have about 10 minutes to tell you about 10 years of my research, so that should be <laughs> awesome. Uh, well over a decade ago, based on nothing but growth in computational power, predictions were made about how soon we'll have computers as capable as one human brain, multiple human brains, all of humanity, really. And interestingly, the predictor, uh, Dr. Ray Kurzweil, who's an engineer at Google, said that around 2023, we'll have computational capacity to emulate one human brain. Idea being, if you can emulate it, you can get performance similar to what we see from a human brain. So let's see if that happened. Uh, in spring of this year, a program was released. Uh, I think many of you had a chance to play with it called GPT-4 by OpenAI, which in many domains is as capable Excuse of- Excuse me, sir. Can you pull your mic a little bit closer, please? I can move myself closer. Some of us are hard hearing like me. Okay. Is this better? Awesome. Uh, so GPT-4 is uh, better than- many people in many domains, greater than some in other domains. It's not a general intelligence. It's not better than all humans in all domains yet. But uh, on kind of standard tests and measures, things like law exam, medical exam, GRE, AP exams, it tends to score very, very well. Sometimes 99th percentile of uh, those are usually very smart individuals, graduate students, so well above average for humans. And uh, this is what we have right now, and it's uh, getting better and better. I took half a day off to come here. It's probably likely that something new has been developed and I'm completely out of date and state of the art in AI. So this is where we are today already. This is not futuristic projections. This is the systems we have today connected to internet, capable of accessing all sorts of other software to assist you with your work. So interesting question is, of course, what happens next? If you believe uh, predictions from people running top AI labs, whatever it's DeepMind at Google, Anthropic, they are saying we are likely to get what is known as artificial general intelligence within two to three years, meaning a system as smart as any of us in all domains. It can learn new skills. It can do anything a human can do. So obviously amazing impact on economy, free labor, physical, cognitive, but uh, in two to three years. If you don't believe uh, leaders of the labs, they might have some personal interest. We can look at prediction markets. Prediction markets are people betting on outcomes of future events. Uh, there we're looking at maybe four years, five years until AGI. Uh, I don't think it makes a huge difference. Let's just say this may happen very soon. Uh, this technology is coming. and I, I think it's good to kind of think about uh, what, what that means. Uh, also, this is GPT-4. You can look at previous versions of the software, GPT-3, GPT-2. They usually get exponentially better. So what do we expect from GPT-5? Is exactly that, artificial general intelligence systems capable of uh, doing high-level intellectual work in most domains. You are a legislative body. You are trying to control humans, which are by definition human-level human intelligences with laws and regulations. We don't have an equivalent for controlling AI systems. 
In fact, we don't even know if it's possible, uh, whatever it's AGIs and human level or something called super intelligence systems which are smarter than all humans in all domains which is very likely to happen as with narrow domains we already see computers become super intelligent in chess and go in many other well-defined domains uh, many of you probably saw jeopardy where that was illustrated so we expect to have super intelligent systems soon and the state of the art in science is we don't even know if we can solve this problem, much less claiming that we have working safety mechanisms in place or even prototypes for such mechanisms. I'm not the only one who feels that the problem may be unsolvable. If you look at uh, latest work, again, at some of those top labs, Anthropic calls it pessimistic scenarios where, oh, sorry, uh, they say that we are possibly not capable of controlling systems of such capability. And they are not putting a specific number on it. They're saying, well, it's one of the possibilities. Maybe it's a hard problem, but we can solve it. Maybe it's an easy problem, but we'll get there. But there is, let's say, 15% chance that we are in this universe where this is impossible to happen. And they are asking this, what is this uh, probability for you? You are intelligent people. Do you think it's possible to indefinitely control super intelligent agents and that's of course very important for making sure they are fitting in with our social structure legal structure economic structure and not causing significant damage including existential risk my research over the last couple of years is full time trying to figure out this uh, this very question can we control more advanced uh, types of software, artificial intelligence. The way I see it is you need a toolbox of capabilities to do it. You need to understand how they work. You need to be able to predict decisions they would make, uh, verify if software actually matches designs, be able to unambiguously communicate with those systems, and many similar things, but you get the general gist. And for each one of those tools, I'm trying to understand, can we have that tool? Is that something we can actually code up? And it seems there are strong limitations on those capabilities. We cannot fully understand how the systems work. We're talking about millions, billions of connected nodes with weights. We may analyze a specific neuron and realize it targets certain visual pattern or sound pattern, but we don't understand how they fully work. We don't really have an alternative other than looking at a model as a whole and a model is too complex to comprehend. So both explainability of those models and comprehensibility to a human brain is limited. They are black boxes. Similarly, we cannot predict what a smarter system would do. If you could, you would be that smart. If you could predict what a chess opponent does for every future move, you're playing at that level. So there are limits to our ability to predict precisely what a smarter agent would do. We can figure out general direction, but we cannot anticipate specific moves. There are limits on verifying code, verifying mathematical proofs. Basically, all software has bugs. You can invest a lot of resources to reduce amount of those bugs, but you can never fully get rid of them. Probabilistically, there is still always a chance that the system is making a mistake. And if a system is making billions of decisions every minute, you are basically guaranteed to have accidents and problems. Communication is also a problem. Human language is notoriously ambiguous. When you write laws, clever lawyers usually find some sort of a way to avoid uh, following the law as intended. Here we're talking about a super intelligent lawyer who would find any imprecise, ambiguous language in the orders and ethical and moral guidelines for those systems. So overall, the conclusion I'm coming to is that it's impossible to indefinitely control superintelligent systems. They will always find a way to bypass our best safety mechanisms, either through directly hacking software, through manipulating their human handlers, through blackmail, through bribery, or simply by being smarter than us and doing things we cannot predict because they are unpredictable. So there is this trade-off between capability and control. We have very good narrow systems, systems which allow us to do things like solve 
protein folding problem, for example, a major medical breakthrough, but which are not general. They are not AGI, they are not superintelligence. And so we can get the benefits of this technology without the risk of having systems we cannot control. I gave you a quick summary of some of the more interesting limiting results, but there are many. In fact, recently we published a paper with some 50 impossibility results in this space. I don't anticipate you to read this. It's not a fun read, but the point is that there is a lot we don't know and a lot which is likely uh, simply impossible to ever overcome in terms of limits to control on this technology. I'm not the only one, as I said. We were successful at publishing some of these ideas uh, in major journals, books, but also in places like Time magazine, the idea that uh, superintelligent systems may be uncontrollable. Others agree, from founding father of computer science and AI, Alan Turing, to more recent uh, researchers and developers such as Elon Musk. There is a growing concern and a growing consensus that superintelligence may be uncontrollable. This is the 10 slides I had. Hopefully I made the 10 minute mark and I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have about this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Actually, uh, this came about, I wanna give kudos to Representative uh, Grossberg. He, uh, we had a group come on and tell us how great it was and what a great thing it was, but I think it's important to hear both sides. And we do have some questions, believe it or not, which I thought it would probably generate some conversation. First off the bat, we have Senator Thomas. Thank you, Chairman Pratt. Is it Yampolsky? Am I? Okay, thank You've you. You got Winston. it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Yampolsky, first of all, let me say I'm glad that Representative Pratt or Chairman Pratt asked you to come here today uh, because as I've said to many of my members, my caucus in particular, I think this is the most important issue that lawmakers across the country must address and deal with in 2024. Uh, and I know Congress had a similar uh, committee meeting about two weeks ago. The problem with that committee meeting was they had all big tech representatives there, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, Amazon, obviously those that had a financial interest in, in, in seeing AI developed uh, and expanded. Um, and I'm always reminded that as elected officials in government, there are only three, three responsibilities we have, only three. And that first one is to maintain the safety and security of our citizens. That's our number one task. Okay. Um, and so I'm glad that we have someone who who's not doesn't have a financial interest coming to talk to us today about our AI. I want to emphasize that. I, I'm highly concerned when you say that this is a is it, this is a, an entity, a process that can't be controlled. Because the last thing I want to have on my legacy is that we're creating a Frankenstein here that's that's going to destroy our society. I don't think we can let that happen. And, and you're right, that is not personal at all. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for ways in which, obviously, uh, we can use AI for its good, but we don't want to have it created so that, that some monster can come along uh, and create uh, a process or a software or a system that's going to destroy us. So can you address that question? Because I think that's really the $64,000 question here that we lawmakers across this country have to address going into 2024. You want me to solve the problem? <laughs> I, I, I want you to give us and give me some ideas of, of, of what we can do to control it, or if we can't, Maybe we should just not have it at all. So, uh, as I said, I don't want to suggest specific legislation in any way, but it seems that there is a lot of untapped economic potential in existing technology. A system like GPT-4 can be studied and deployed for the next 50 years, growing our economy exponentially. We don't have to create superintelligence for the next two years, five years. There is not a pressing need for that. Uh, it's often speculated that uh, we have to do it or the bad guys get there first and then it's worse. 
if it's uncontrolled, it doesn't matter who has super intelligence first, whatever it's Kentucky, US, China, it's the same result, right? You're not controlling it, it's an independent agent. So it's good if there is self-interest from those companies to not destroy the world and themselves included, if they are encouraged by the government to limit capabilities. Uh, there was a, a call for a pause, six month pause in develop, development of more capable systems than GPT-4, but it was based on six months. Why? It's an arbitrary number, means nothing. You have to request same type of moratorium based on capabilities. Until you can show that your system is not a black box, we can understand how it works, we can predict what it does, all the impossibility results I mentioned are addressed and solved, then you can go ahead and deploy a more capable system because now we have some assurance that it meets safety and security standards you can set. Thanks, sir. All right, next we have Representative Baker. Thank you, sir. And thank you for being here to, to share this with us today. Um, AI is a great tool, but it can also be a very evil thing, and you know that far better than I do. One of my concerns is the idea that you could use that to make an image, a likeness, or replicate a voice of a living person. Um, do you, I, I, I see some issues with that going forward and, and how that could be used in, in nefarious ways. Are there other issues, and this may be very similar to, to Senator Thomas's question, other issues that you perhaps foresee that could create problems for us down the road uh, with AI? Uh, many. I don't want to give any ideas, but luckily I'm not super intelligent. So what you're asking is what I would do to cause problems. Uh, I'm not super intelligent. The system would come up with much better things. Mm -hmm. Deep fakes are a big problem. The way this technology works, you have two neural networks competing. One generating fakes, one trying to detect them. They meet in the middle. It's a 50-50, so you can't figure out if it's real or not. This technology can be used for spear phishing attacks at unprecedented scale instead of tailoring a single email for one individual by studying their social media i can now target millions of accounts i can create a video of someone you trust your chairman your spouse telling you hey send some money give me your password even experts would click on such a link agree to such a request but uh, this is not the worst uh, you have systems which are doing science now doing uh, research, for example, in chemistry or biology. So we're talking about COVID 2.0. You can design new viruses. You can design chemical weapons. You can design uh, all sorts of uh, tools for hacking important cyber infrastructure, power plants, nuclear response, military response. Uh, there is really, with general systems smarter than humans, you are not limited by any <clears throat> set of restrictions other than how creative the system is, uh, how much it can exploit human psyche thank you may, may i ask a follow-up please yes sir so obviously that's very concerning <laughs> thank you um the um it's one one thing to try to create laws and and put safeguards in place to keep me or you or someone else from doing that i don't have the the knowledge or capacity to do it myself but when you're talking about being uncontrollable if we could put laws in place to keep me from doing it or to punish me from doing things wrongfully, at some point, are you saying that regardless of what I do over time, it can just generate some of those things themselves uh, within the system? The cost of training the next model becomes less and less with time. Hardware becomes more capable. Today, it may cost $100 million. Tomorrow, it's $10 million, $1 million. Eventually, any teenager in a garage and their laptop can generate human level equivalent model. It's like personal nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. There is not much you can do with legislation. The joke I kind of make is we're going to make it illegal to destroy humanity and there are steep fines for doing that. Yeah. Like you can't enforce something like that. And to enforce, uh, meaningfully enforce any legislation, you should be able to monitor deployment and training of those systems. And there are impossibility results related to that. Until we train the model, we don't really know what it's capable of. So if they are training GPT-5 right now, I'm not saying they are, mm -hmm. but something like that, until it is trained and studied, we don't even know if it's already beyond human capacity or not. We still discover things about GPT-4. 
till this day people go, oh, it can play with new musical instrument or something. Uh, it is a very understudied area. And uh, I, I think a lot of times with legislation, we, we pass feel-good legislation. Mm -hmm. Spam is illegal, computer viruses are illegal, but at the end they get both. Yes. So as long as it takes a you know, billion dollars worth of compute, a major Manhattan project size effort, you can regulate it. You know where the centers are, you know who has the chips. If it becomes more affordable, it's unlikely to succeed through governance. Yes. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Representative Grossberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for indulging me by bringing this guest today. I wasn't sure how it would work out, but I'm glad to say I, I, I think it's working out well. Um, and I would like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, to put it in context for everyone, you and I have had a number of meals together where you create a level of panic in me that there's not a person in the General Assembly who can create. But at the same time, I feel the need to point out that you have three small children, you are investing in their, smallish, investing in their education and still investing in your own retirement. And I asked you about that and you told me it's because you're not certain. So I think it's important for everyone to know that even the most catastrophic uh, predictions still allow for a, a future that's worth living. Um, one time I asked you to put in context, like, how big of a deal is this? Is this like the discovery of electricity or is this like the uh, first automations? And you told me I've got to think bigger, that the last time humanity has embarked on something this revolutionary and this much of a game changer, it would either be the discovery of fire or the discovery of language. So just to put it in context for everyone, that's how big what we're looking at is. But... I'm glad to hear from my colleagues here that everyone sees this as either a bipartisan or a nonpartisan issue. It's not an us versus them. It's all of us together to make sure that uh, the professor is not wasting his time and energy educating his kids and investing in his own retirement. The biggest part of that, when I asked you, why is this so much bigger to you than chemical biological or nuclear pr weapons proliferation and all the concerns that existed over the last 60, 70 years, you told me in two words, or actually it's, it's three, it's tool versus agent, that all of those are concerns about a tool, a weapon that needs to be harnessed and deployed by a person versus this is the first time that there will be an agent that can be self-acting, that to use the metaphor of Dr. Frankenstein, once released, may not be able to be controlled. And on top of that, um, we, myself included, have a tendency to use the word evil, that I don't want to release an evil technology. And you reminded me that technology is neither moral nor immoral, it's amoral. So what we can't do is regulate the technology. We can regulate what people can do towards researching or deploying that technology. And with that, one of the articles you had me read uh, was, I believe it was six different scenarios, worst case scenarios, uh, that, that you perceive as being likely to happen if we don't do anything. And I encourage the rest of you to read it. And let's just say that the matrix looks not bad in comparison to, to some of these. Uh, and when I asked you, how do we get there? You gave me a couple simple examples. You know, if someone, who wants to be a lone wolf terrorist gets their hand on this technology and says, destroy the financial systems. This actor, the not the, the person, but the software is smarter than every single person working in every financial institution and every computer programmer combined and has a head start and could probably achieve it. If someone intended something good and didn't have the proper protocols, you gave me the example of COVID comes back stronger or a new super bug and someone tells AI, solve it so that no one more gets COVID. Well, the easiest way to make sure no one more gets COVID would be to kill all humans. And if you don't put in the proper parameters and the programming, that will happen. And then you gave me another example that if you told it we want to explore further in the universe and need bigger satellites and bigger telescopes, that without the proper parameters, the AI would say, well, these humans have precious metals in their bloodstreams and in their cells. Let's just digest the entire Earth, including all humans, and convert everything on Terra Major to a massive 
uh, satellite systems. So those are just a few of what sound like outlandish examples. But as you pointed out, we don't know what superintelligence can and will do because we are not super intelligent. So the thing that you said you're not going to do, but I'm going to put you on the spot, is you said you're not a policymaker. Well, we are, and, and you identifying for us these problems has been extremely valuable. But the question I have for you is, if in that magical world where you didn't make fun of me for being a uh, policymaker on a regular basis and you were one of us, what is it precisely that you would do? What, as a parent of three mostly small children, is it that you're asking of us besides just generally study AI and its dangers? A wonderful question. I feel like I should have put more disclaimers about hazardous information into my presentation with you listing all of them. Um, I, as I said, I bring problems. I don't have solutions. If you can create an incentive structure where it is better for those companies and leaders to monetize their existing tech as opposed to trying to win that arms race to be there first. Right now, I think uh, Google DeepMind is uh, releasing a product maybe in December, Gemini, that is a response from OpenAI. So if we, before we said, oh, it's going to be two years, it's too soon. Now we're saying, let's release it tomorrow. We don't have time to test it. Are they going to beat us? If there is anything you can do to make incentives work and whoever does it slowest and safest wins, then we all possibly might win. But I am not optimistic that uh, you can beat industry in terms of timelines and deployment. To, Thanks, say, to say something very nice and positive, so Representative Grossberg is my biggest success story. Nobody ever changes their mind on anything than presented with new information and evidence. He went from making fun of me and my silly Terminator scenarios to actually taking it seriously. So I would applaud that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next is Rep. Kokarni. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Yampolsky, for being here. And good to see you again. I had the privilege earlier this summer of being on a panel with you discussing exactly this question and the scenarios. You also had a very limited amount of time then to present your entire body of knowledge and research. Um, I want to briefly just maybe clarify, I think, for our, some of our committee members and for myself. We tend to talk about AI as if it's some distinct and discrete entity that exists over here that we can do things to or control or not control or that is itself um, going to do something on its own, like it's separate and apart, as opposed to a model that we are currently training, right, in terms of its intelligence and its ability to think. So I wanted to clarify also that there, there is some scope. There are various scenarios, as you say, one of the comments I made was that all of this, so open AI, all of the generative image generating software, all of the things that we are able to input our questions and our concerns and you know just trying it out, chat GPT, are, are taking all of that information and training these models, right? And they're all owned by private companies, which is to your point, the only way we can control the, the speed at which this accelerates, this model adapts and learns. So in terms of laws, we've got laws for intellectual property to Representative Baker's point, protecting identities, protect, protecting likenesses. Um, but if it gets to a certain point, laws won't matter anymore is what you're saying to us. So at this point, hopefully, before we've gotten there, before that tipping point, I wanted to, to ask you is, is, for instance, open AI is, is one of the things on your slides, is the way to control this, you mentioned incentivizing private companies to slow down, do it safely, uh, do it in a more sustainable way so that we don't destroy ourselves. Um, is that possible to do even now? So what, with the models and the platforms that they have developed, is it too late to slow that down? Do they have enough? input right now to just proceed on their own? Is that the question that well, is unanswered? They likely do, but we have no chance other than to try. We have no alternatives. You correctly said that what we deal with right now is mostly tools. 
we train those models, we can shut them off. But the switch to that agenthood where they are independent is what they are talking about in the next two to four years. So that's not a lot of time. And we have to get it right on a first try. We're not going to get a second chance, third chance. A lot of times in cybersecurity, somebody hacks the system, you reset passwords, you reissue credit cards, you get to try again. This is not like that. Superintelligence safety is very different from standard cybersecurity. So again, a lot of those things are unlikely to work out, but doing nothing is still strictly worse. Right, quick follow up, Mr. Chair. I also, on that same slide, so I'm, I'm an attorney, I took the LSAT, and I took it because I'm terrible at math, and the LSAT was more about logic. So I've noticed that it is scoring, for instance, in this uh, exam slide that you have, in the 88th percentile for LSATs. It didn't do so well in English language and composition. Does that mean anything? Is that some way to possibly slow it down where it's not so good at processing certain thought patterns or learning certain things as opposed to calculus and things that are rote memorization? It is still not a general intelligence. We are still much better in many, many ways. We are still in charge today. Uh, I think with specific exams on that slide, some are more, um, how can I say it, they have actual answers as opposed to opinions and how a poem feels. So it, it's easier to grade accurately, whereas humans may have a bias towards human-generated outputs of certain kind. So it's not indicative necessarily of anything? I don't think poetry will save us. Okay. For a while, we hoped that art and poetry is what we're going to do when we have complete technological unemployment. But in a surprising twist, computers learn to do that first. Great. So right now we are still plumbers and janitors and they are writing poetry. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman. You're welcome. Representative Stalker. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so here is what, ha th this is a little bit of a comment, a little bit of a question. So uh, <laughs> just want to give you the heads up. Let's work through this together. Here's what I'm concerned about is I know that there was an article I think put out by Forbes that indicated something about 300 million jobs that were going to be lost or degraded just within the United States and Europe because of AI. And what I, what I wonder about is, you know what what that what what kind of time frame do we let's just focus here in, in Kentucky and the state that we're focused in what do we have to look forward to um, from a time frame perspective and coupled with that something that I think is important for this body to think about is that we often other states do the same thing we like to invite companies to come in and set up shop here and not tax them properly and give them all sorts of you know, breaks um, with the, you know, trade-off and expectation that there will be jobs created for our people, Kentuckians here. And what I worry about is the fact that folks will come in and, you know, only to lose, you know, for Kentuckians to lose their jobs shortly, you know, after in the near future because AI is replacing them. So anything that you can um, say in response to that, I'd be curious to hear. So... It used to be there was two concerns, short-term concerns and long-term concerns. Short-term was things like technological unemployment. Will we lose jobs? And, you know, existential risk, suffering risk was 20 years away. We don't have to worry about it. But looking at predictions for capabilities, it uh, actually may have switched where we'll have systems capable of generating dangerous chemical weapons in two years, but it takes five, 10 years to deploy existing technology to actually replace workers. Today, we have AI capable of replacing anyone in food service, essentially. It's not beyond capabilities, both in terms of taking orders and actually cooking food. There is uh, automation, human-like robots capable of doing that. But it takes time to deploy, to train, to really make it happen. So it's interesting that maybe what was long-term concerns are actually overtaking those uh, short-term considerations. If you get human-level intelligence, AGI, then all cognitive labor is automatable, no exception. 
if uh, we deploy robots like what uh, Boston Dynamics, so now Tesla is creating humanoid robots, same goes for physical labor. You can automate all jobs. If we take it to extreme for superintelligence, we have nothing to contribute to a superintelligence. You're not smarter, you're not funnier, you're not a better poet. What happens at that stage? There are risks to our existence, existential risks, and then there are risks to what we call ikigai risks, a word for meaning. It will take the meaning away from us, purpose. Why do we even exist? You're not contributing anything. You're not a legislator, you're not a lawyer, you're not a teacher. All right. Next, we have Rep. Dodson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Dr. Yampolsky. Uh, I tell you what, I wish, I so admire you. I wish I had just a thousandth of the understanding and knowledge that you have about stuff like this. And the way you speak so intelligently about the matter is very, very humbling for me. But just to piggyback off of what Representative Baker has said about protecting image and likeness, that is so concerning because you can take AI and I'll show you a little example, and it's worth mentioning. And you could take a politician, take any one of us, and put us in a KK rally. KKK rally. You know what I'm saying? And make us look bad. I mean, it's not just us, but protecting the individual. I mean, AI is so advanced now, they could take our voice and say something that we didn't say. So when you think about these things that can be very intimidating, going forward and it's just like uh with the firestorm that's going on in washington dc with senator uh fetterman uh him coming to dress a certain way and it's just a firestorm going on well a major entity on twitter had put out this uh this picture of Rand paul coming and sitting on the senate steps and uh sitting there in his robe and just looking all casual and it's kind of funny to look at but it looked like it was a little out of character so we reached out to Senator Paul's office, and they said, no, that was created by AI. Because we want to know, is that really him? And it's funny. But that can be so potentially dangerous. I mean, on, honestly, you could create a video of someone with AI, make them a pedophile if you want to. I just was trying to throw some things out there that you could look at and, and just say, what can we do now before this gets out of control, before it snowballs to the, to the place that, that it can be? Um, and so that is my concern. We need to protect our people. I mean, if somebody's got an alt against somebody, it would be easy if you're technologically advanced to create something to make someone look so bad. So I just wanted to share that with the committee, and hopefully, you know, it's something that we could talk about uh, going forward and your input to helping us get some legislation that would, that would be so valuable. Thank you so much. Uh, great question. Thank you. So there is technology which helps. Uh, you can do cryptographic proofs of origins. Uh, so a camera, while it's taking pictures, a video, can sign the feed and you know it's authenticated. The problem is not just technology, it's the humans. There is a non-zero percentage of population who is sure the planet is flat. No amount of pictures or videos will change that. And with deep fakes, the only positive thing I can say is it gives you a certain degree of plausible deniability when they catch you in a real bad situation. <laughs> All right, next we have Rep. Maddox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually do not have a question. I just am very much appreciative of the robust discussion. Thank you, sir. All right, next is Rep. McPherson. Yes, if you'll just indulge me just a second, it sounds like from a country boy standpoint here that you know we can probably talk about some legislation that will help put some buffers in place and some things, but truthfully, we're in war. We're going to be at war. We're constantly in war. If you don't think our country's at war with lots of things going on every day, we probably wouldn't want to know what's going on behind the scenes to keep us safe every day. So the only way to win war is to go in as aggressive as you can. So it sounds like to me that we've just got to go at this as aggressive as we can and make sure that the bad actors don't outdo the good actors. Is that, and, and I understand that the intelligent part of that is you don't, once you release something, it's kind of like what you said a while ago, when you ask a genie for a wish, you better watch what you ask for because sometimes if you look at that, you don't know what that means. You have to explore all the 
ask before you do the asking. So it just sounds like we have to be as aggressive as we can to make sure we keep this at bay. Is that? So if we're talking about tools, obviously whoever has better tools will win in a war. We're seeing it in Ukrainian conflict sure. with better drones, better communication satellites, and so on. But the moment we switch to an agent, a superintelligent agent, it doesn't matter who summoned the demons. If China invites aliens or Russians invite aliens or we invite them, it's the same aliens who are going to come, and what they do is beyond our control. Sounds like we just have to have a better demon. I don't think anyone will win. Demon Wars will be, you know, just a casualty of that conflict. Thank you. All right. And next is Senator Howe. And thank you for being here today. Um, so much of our lives are, inter are coupled together, interrelated, uh, fully integrated, using the Internet and other means. Is there any discussion being had in this arena uh, where we may have to decouple and separate certain parts of, uh, of what we do and how we operate, like separating the financial system? I don't like build a firewall is the only w uh, way that I that I can understand how to do. Is there any discussion about how to separate uh, certain things that we do so to 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 isolate things from from some of the harmful, potentially harmful effects of, of AI? Um, I may not answer my question or ask my question very well. But so there is some uh, work on privacy, making sure the systems are not training on something they should not be training on. There is also uh, research taking place on direct human brain computer interfaces. Basically, a computer would be able to see what you are thinking directly. So that has obvious implications for First Amendment, for privacy laws, and there is some proposed legislation for protecting privacy of thought, not just speech, but thinking freedom, but uh, nothing particularly uh, with uh, separating one department within the government from AI infrastructure comes to mind right now. Not necessarily maybe in the government, just within our lives or anything. Is there any, I just wondered if there was any way that... that if, if you want to keep something private, don't put it on the internet. Don't digitize it. Write it with a pen and paper did, and then burn it. So did, you, so did you use AI to hear me tell my kids that over and over? Is that usually repeating that? <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you again for your testimony. I, I, I think we got all the questions asked. You know, again, thank you for your testimony. I know you got a busy time. And actually, again, like I said, we had the other side come and talk to us, and thanks to Rep. Rep. Grossberg that, you know, he brought you up. And one thing that did strike me really interesting about our first presenters was they kept talking about human bias uh, in AI, which raised well, my antennas. And then shortly after that, I did see an article which says, what happens when hackers talk AI into doing bad things? And it's happening. So... Again, it's a, it, we'll try to get our arms, uh, heads, wrap our arms around this, our heads around this, and I do believe this is a nonpartisan, bipartisan issue. I look forward to working with people on my committee to figure out what we need to do, how we need to do this. I look for your input. I look forward to legislation. But this is something if we don't do anything about, one day we may wish we had. So thank you very much for your time today, sir. And I knew this would generate a lot of questions and look forward to as we go forward with this. Thank you so much.